Roy would just walk around the neighborhood however he wanted. He would go out publicly with nothing on but a down vest and no shirt and in really baggy cargo shorts that had no belt and were basically hanging off of him. He was a quintessentially New York character. Roy Newell was a close friend of mine who was originally a member of the Abstract Expressionists. Early on, he would spend a lot of time in the New York Public Library art reference room, where I guess a lot of artists at that time would hang out. It was also where he met Willem de Kooning, and they became friends. They came to artistic maturity at the same time, along with Jackson Pollock and Phil Gustin, Franz Klein, many others. He had a very adversarial relationship with Jackson Pollock. There was more than one occasion where the two of them squared off and fought each other at the Cedar Tavern. None of them had any money. None of them had any formal gallery representation. In fact, American art as we've come to know it hadn't really begun. His friends, Franz Klein and de Kooning, began to pioneer the large scale, big painting that we've come to know as being abstract expressionist. Roy initially was part of that group and was making large gestural paintings. At a certain point, for reasons that aren't completely clear, he stopped doing that and he destroyed all of those paintings. They were all moving in one direction. He was moving in the polar opposite direction. As the others were getting larger and larger and larger and more and more bombastic, he was getting smaller and smaller and smaller and more hermetic. His brushwork became sort of post-impressionist or pointillist, informed by the French painters, Vuillard and Bonnard. He was fascinated with color and texture. There is this expressive power that aligns him with the abstract expressionists. It's kind of channeled through the rigidity of the grid. Coming out of Mondrian, Roy took that kind of hard-edged abstraction into this very emotional, painterly space that had to do with surface. And that was, I think, what his real contribution was. I got to know Roy many years later at a gallery opening in Chelsea called the Gallery of Living Artists. He invited me to his studio and the place was crowded with paintings everywhere, just covering the walls. And I realized that he had been working on these paintings for a long time, the same paintings. They were always slightly different. One month it would be green everywhere. The next month would have been overtaken with a burnt umber. And it kind of just went on like this over a period of months and then years. He worked primarily in oil on canvas or oil on panel. A lot of them had a small frame that he painted over and around the frame, which turns the painting into more of this almost sculptural object. Over time, the tremendous amount of paint built up in layers just increases the sort of sculptural object quality of the work. The backs are great because you have up in like four different directions with arrows everywhere, dates, sometimes dating back four decades. The backs of the paintings become events in and of themselves. Roy's biggest influence was Albert Pinkham Ryder. He really admired his constant reworking of images. So he was aware of his own working methodology and the idiosyncrasy of it. Roy's work, more than many other artists, requires you to go physically interact and see these works. Every show of Roy's is really like a retrospective because all the works had been remade many, many times over in between those shows. So you were getting this kind of survey every time he had an exhibition. There was the Dowling College show. There was the Gallery of Living Artists show with John and Christine Woodward. There was the Earl McGrath show. And then there was the show that I curated with Carolina Nietzsche in Chelsea. Robert Harris, he and I worked together on the subsequent exhibition at the Pollock Kranzner House. That's a very limited amount of shows, but every time there was an exhibition, he got a full review in the New York Times, a pretty elusive thing for artists. I would hope that this exhibit and this partnership with Sotheby's will allow people to understand Roy's great contribution to the art of that time. He was way ahead of himself in many ways. I really feel like towards the very end of his life, he felt like he had finished. I will say that from my eye, the paintings were in this kind of radiant place at the very, very end. Mm -hmm.